So, it's kicking off the recording. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Happy May 4th. And uh, today we have the wonderful Janice Gary with us. She is one of Alachua County's Master Gardener volunteers. And she's also a beekeeper, which I'm super pumped about because she's able to come and do a program just on beekeeping basics. Because I know we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, pollinator gardens and how to plant for pollinator gardens. But I know many of us are also really interested in what's to do with bees and how beekeeping works, um, especially for backyard beekeepers. Uh, so um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, because what we'll be able to do is the, the panelist and I will be able to follow those questions on there and respond to those questions. And um, <clears throat> then what we'll end up doing is as we respond to those questions, they'll pop up on your screen. But you can also put little notes or if we ask questions, you can put those things in the chat box. But this is recorded and we'll follow up with everybody with a copy of the presentation so you can always reference reference it later. But I do want to thank everybody for joining us today and especially I want to thank Janice for taking the time to put this presentation together. I've already been telling her like maybe five times that I'm super excited about this presentation. <laughs> so Janice, uh, thank you very much and you can take over from here. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm very excited to talk about one of my very favorite topics. And I have a lot of favorite topics, but beekeeping is on top of the list. Um, you will see my subtitle here is for love of honeybees. Um, my intention today is not to talk you into being a beekeeper. Like all hobbies, beekeeping is not for everybody. My intention is for you to leave this um, chat having a new appreciation for honeybees and what really wonderful creatures they are and how important they are to us, even though a lot of times they are unrecognized, and to appreciate beekeepers and what it takes to be a beekeeper and what it takes to produce that honey and what it takes to pollinate crops. So hang on to your beekeeping hats because here we go. I began beekeeping in 2012 um, because every August, which is a terrible time in Florida, um, there is National Beekeeping Day. And the Gainesville Area Bee Club put on this big um, festiv festival about beekeeping. And I went, I saw a hive inspection, I started chatting. And then three neighbors, including myself, so there are two other neighbors, stood in the middle of the street and talked about how cool it would be to be beekeepers. And from that, we developed a plan that we were going to choose one of the houses. It was my neighbor's house across the street. And that's where we were gonna put hives and we were gonna do it as a beekeeping trio. And it, it turns out that's actually a really great strategy. When you first get into beekeeping, there are so many things to know. When you go into the hive, there are so many things to look at that it actually turned out to be a great strategy to have three sets of eyes and three sets of hands. So we did that for a couple of years before I said, hey, I love these girls and I want them in my backyard. So from there, I started keeping them in my backyard. Um, I was uh, president of Gainesville Area Bee Club for five years. I actually was president before I had bees, which just goes to show in all organizations, there is a desperate need for leadership. Um, so that was a fun thing to do. I am uh, a hobbyist beekeeper. There are different levels of nomenclature for what kind of beekeeper you are, depending on the number. Um, interestingly, in the state of Florida, beekeeping is allowed in all cities. Um, it was a state law that was passed, gosh, 10 years ago, because we're an agricultural state. So in my backyard with where I live, with my size of area, I'm allowed three hives maximum. Uh, during the, uh, during the uh, peak of the season, I can have an additional three, um, but during uh, the most of the time I can have three. Beekeeping for me is a hobby that is more than the sum of its parts. You talk about the little bits of it to get, um, as separate, but when you put them all together, I can tell you that I've been doing this for, gosh, 10 years, and um, it never ceases to thrill me. It is just, 
it is just the most fun hobby. It's always a surprise. The girls are always up to something new. So um, why be a beekeeper? I am somebody who really enjoys being outside. And when you are a beekeeper, you become very aware of the climate. You become very aware of the seasons. You become very aware of botany because it ties in so closely to what your bees are doing and what your bees will be doing. And beekeeping is all about strategizing and, um, and preparing the best environment possible for your bees and having those things in place ahead of time. For me, it's another great reason to get outside. I habitually go out and watch my girls flying in out of the hive. I like to see what color of pollen they're bringing in. I like to see their energy level. I like to see um, what time they get up in the morning because if it's cloudy, they're gonna get up a little later than if it's uh, sunny. Um, it's just so, some people like in watching bees to, you know how a fish tank is just naturally a calming, interesting activity. Well, for us, that's how we feel about watching bees come and go. Um, honeybees are fascinating. I like to say that honey uh, beekeeping is a very intellectual experience. There is so much to know about these litter critters. There is so much new that they're always doing. Um, it's just a fascinating activity and um, it, it always keeps you thinking. They're always keeping you thinking. So for honey, for uh, uh, beekeeping products, when I first started, I had no intentions of actually collecting any honey or wax or anything like that. I just thought it was a very fun thing to do. It turns out that in a typical year for me, out of two hives in my backyard, I harvest between 100 to 120 pounds of honey. And please keep in mind that that's leaving 50 pounds of honey for the bees. So honey has become a huge part of my diet. It goes in my coffee, goes in my yogurt. I have some very nice appetizers and snacky kinds of things that I make for guests. I get Myers lemons from my neighbors whose trees are pollinated because of my girls. I give them honey, they give me lemons and we make lemonade. Um, another unexpected product that I get from um, my hives is um, wax. And I'll show you later on how I use that. Wax is a very um, labor intensive product for bees. Um, so if you collect a lot of wax, you're going to sacrifice some of your honey, um, but I do get some wax and um, I have gotten to where I think you could see this. I make very simple little beeswax candles. I use them when I'm doing my yoga and meditating. I also make a product that is, um, it's about 30% beeswax, about 70% olive oil. And then in this, I put um, some lavender essential oil. <laughs> I feel like a Doc's Medicine Show because truly this is a product that I use on everything. I use this on my antique furniture. It enhances and nourishes the wood. I use this on my skin. Um, I use this on wounds. Uh, wax like honey has antimicrobial products in it and it helps with healing. Um, and you may have noticed I have curly hair. This is actually a lovely styling gel for curly hair. So it truly is a, uh, it, it's, it's just amazing how many things I use that for. Janice, I think you just convinced everybody to start being beekeeping. So I know you said that your goal isn't to have everyone know, don't expect to go out and do that after this program, but I think you've already convinced us all. Well, okay, so, okay, so Taylor, now you've inspired me to, with another little anecdote. On the east coast of Florida, the University of Florida has a, um, uh, a, a laboratory for the study of sea life and specifically turtles. Their laboratory 
contacted our bee club some years back and asked us to donate wax. When sea turtles have an injury to their shell, the perfect thing to use for healing is beeswax. Again, because it has antimicrobial products, so it helps prevent infection. It has anti-inflammatory products, which help with healing. And it seals the shell so that the um, turtle can heal and not suffer further harm. So we donated beeswax to the University of Florida uh, Sea Lab. So next we are going to go into a, with great uh, luck and uh, great courage, I'm going to try to share a video with you. This uh, video is Dr. Jamie Ellis, who is our administrator for University of Florida Entomology Honeybees. The, uh, Dr. Ellis is the brainchild behind a new bee lab that was built um, a couple of years ago and is um, world renowned for the quality of the bee lab and the research they do. So I'm gonna go into here and I am going to click a couple of little buttons here. And then I'm going to click this video and hope for the best. This unforgettable vacation memory. It didn't actually begin. It didn't work, but I know why. This memory began when dad booked his family summer vacation. You're not seeing it? No. Um, go ahead and pause the video. Okay, um, because you're doing the share, do your share of your entire screen. I'm going to skip that. Okay. Um, go ahead um, and do this is just a second. Uh, do a stop share and reshare again, but your entire screen rather than just the PowerPoint. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to skip that. Okay. Okay. Are we back? Yes, we are. Okay, so folks, uh, that uh, was a wonderful technical glitch, and so I'm not going to go back to it. Um, but when you get this information, you're going to see that clip, and you'll see Dr. Ellis talking about the importance of honeybees. You'll also see him uh, talking about that approximately one third of the food you and I eat every day is because of these honeybees. So needless to say, they're important to us. Uh, my screen is not advancing. Uh, click. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Okay. All righty. So um, if you were at last month's uh, meeting, you would have heard about invasive species and non-invasive species and, um, and I'm sorry, native species and non-native species. And the definition that the state of Florida has for non-natives is those who were here since the Europeans came. Well, guess who's invasive? We call our honeybees European honeybees because they came here from Europe. Back in the 1600s, when those ships sailed across the pond and came here, along with them, they brought honeybees. So honeybees are not native to North America. They're native to uh, Europe and Asia and Africa, but not America. So as with anything, there are pros and cons. The advantage of honeybees not being native species is they actually pollinate plants that are non-natives. And many of the foods we eat, many of the fruits that we eat are not native species. So it works out that honeybees pollinate things that you know, pollinate uh, plants that natives would not pollinate. Um, occasionally, when you are talking with people who are very um, are great advocates for native species, they will share some concerns about honeybees um, competing with native species. In my mind, it's really not an issue because if we do lots of planting of natives and non-natives, uh, there's plenty of room for everybody. And um, 
the native pollinators really can't pollinate the plants that we have. Some of you may be aware that the, the most commercially viable product of honeybees is not honey, it's not wax, it's not any of the th those things, it's pollination. And commercial beekeepers in Florida travel from Florida to California to um, rent out or lease out honeybees that um, pollinate all the almond trees in California. And then those bees travel on a truck and go clockwise clear around the United States, pollinating various crops as they come into season. This is not something that native pollinators can do. And this is why you will hear the, the statistic that honeybees pollinate about a third of everything we eat. If you like blueberries, if you like strawberries, thank a honeybee. So as a beekeeper, one of the questions I most often get is, do you ever get stung? Yes. <laughs> I have gotten stung on my head when honeybees get tangled in my hair and can't figure out how to get out. I've been stung on my chin. I've been stung in my arms. I get stung probably, oh, four to six times a year. The trick is dressing accordingly. Uh, you will see in this picture, and can folks see my mouse? Can folks see my mouse? Yeah, we can. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you look, this is the bee veil that you are used to seeing from folks, and you'll see that it has some ventilation in front for breathing. You will notice that the jacket, whoops, pardon me. You will notice that the jacket, everything is baggy. Um, uh, loose is better than tight because if the honeybee, uh, honeybee lands on you and sends a stinger through, it's less likely to get actually all the way through to your skin if you're wearing baggy clothes. If you also look down at the shoes, um, the shoes are carefully tucked so that um, honeybees can't go up the pant leg. Whenever a honeybee uh, walks, it walks uphill. <laughs> so if it lands on your thigh, it's going to walk up. If it lands on your elbow, it's going to walk up. So we tuck everything in with our bee clothes so that if the honeybee walks up, we're not going to get stung. Um, I have never purchased all of this garb. I wore a pair of baggy plant pants and I wore a baggy shirt, an old white shirt um, and, uh, and a bee veil. And you also see that there are le leather gloves. So yippee, bee venom therapy. I don't know if any of these participants have ever heard that there is such a thing as bee venom therapy. Um, it's, it's counterintuitive because when we get stung, the site swells, but it turns out that there are actually four very powerful anti-inflammatories in bee venom. Bee venom has been shown to be helpful to people with muscular sclerosis. It has been helpful to people for various things. I have a personal story about this that I'll share with you briefly. Um, I live in a 1947 house and I did a lot of the uh, labor when the house was remodeled. And after nine months of working with power tools and, uh, and very uh, hard labor, I found that I had tingling and numbness in my arms to the point that it would wake me up out of a very hard sleep. And I thought, I am going to have to go to see a doctor because this really is, uh, this really is uh, getting serious. Well, fortunately, I got stung by a bee. And it stung me in my left shoulder, right where my upper arm uh, goes to the shoulder joint. And within 48 hours, those symptoms were completely gone. And what I found after that is as long as I got stung every couple of months, my arms were symptom free. If I went for several months without getting stung, those symptoms would gradually return. And it's been long enough now that those symptoms don't return anymore. But for me, it was a very dramatic um, demonstration of bee venom actually being therapeutic. 
there are only some, a very small percentage, like 1%, maybe half a percent of people who are allergic to bee venom. And the rest of us, there's some opportunity for it actually being therapeutic. So where do you keep bees? <laughs> um, this is a picture of my home. And I've taken that picture to demonstrate to you that I do not live on a farm. I do not live in a rural area. I live in a um, neighborhood uh, one mile north of the University of Florida campus. My lot is 0.23 acres, and that is plenty of room to be a backyard beekeeper. Um, in the picture on the right, you'll see what I call my, we call this our bee yard. It's where we keep our bees. You'll see that it's located up against a fence so that when my bees fly, they do not fly over to my neighbors. You'll also see there's a lot of vegetation there. Um, the advantage of backyard beekeeping, and this again is counterintuitive, or, or I'm gonna call it um, urban beekeeping, is there is lots of stuff in bloom. People have gardens, people have fruit trees, people have flowers, the roadsides have wildflowers in them, and all of those are resources for the bee to harvest their nectar and pollen. In contrast, I when, when I was very active in the bee club, we had over 100 members, and many of our members lived in rural areas. And in contrast, in a rural area, you may have one type of flower that blooms, and then it's done. And there may be a period of dearth where there is nothing blooming. And those rural beekeepers actually have to feed their bees sugar water, which is a very second rate nutritional, um, it keeps bees alive, but it really doesn't have nutrition. So it's a very, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's useful, but it certainly isn't the optimum food for bees. So I have actually found that living in the city and living in a neighborhood with lots of vegetation has worked to my advantage and worked to my bees' advantage. But mm -hmm. when yes. the, the sucrose that water, that sugar water, is that yes. when you like look at a beehive and it has the jar kind of like screwed on to the top? That's that's what we're looking at. That is exactly what we're looking at. And, okay. uh, it, and on one of the slides, we're going to talk about tools. And I actually brought my little jar in here to show you. But that is exactly what you're looking at. And, and to your point, Taylor, when you drive out in the country, very frequently, you will see those beehives with sugar water on top. And what that tells you is there is not enough for those bees to eat. Um, and so the person has had to um, supplement their diet with sugar water. There were a couple questions that did pop up. You probably okay. might, and you might sure. address them later. Sure. Um, I know Ruth answered some of it about beekeeping registration and inspections with FDAX. Um, yep, but it's coming up. <laughs> in, okay, so you have talked about regulations of like how to, if like in Gainesville, if there's any regulations, do you have anything like that? I don't know yes. if we have any or not. Okay. Um, yes, and and um, and if, I I haven't talked. I have actually in my uh, on my last slide is a list of resources. And um, it, there's a link to registering your, uh, your hive here in Florida. And um, in addition to that, um, uh, so you, there is a registration requirement. Here in Gainesville, like um, here in Gainesville, and, and these, are, these are statewide guidance. Um, I am allowed three hives. And if somebody lived on an acre, they would be allowed more hives. Mm. Um, and all that information is available on the state website. Perfect, thank you. Do you have anything else? Any other there, questions? One was uh, they don't fly over the fence. You, you mentioned that. They do that. fly over the fence. Okay, so they do. Okay, but you have all the flowering stuff in your yard. So it kind of keep, does it keep them contained or are you seeing they're just flying all over the place or can you even tell where your bees are going? Sure, I tell you what, there is no containment of those joyous, hardworking honeybees. They are going to fly all over the place. What is um, interesting, so, so um, it is a good idea and we're gonna, act, I actually have a slide on that coming in, up um, on how to place your beehives. We do need to be respectful when we are in the city and in a neighborhood, we do need to be respectful of other people and um, animals um, and that some people are not comfortable with honeybees. So that is why my beehives are next to a fence 
And when my bees come out, see so now right here, let me see if I can do this without changing. Right there is the hive entrance. So when my bees come out, they come out and, and, and their flight path changes. But typically when my bees come out, they'll fly out about five feet and then those darlings will head up 20, 25 feet up in the air. One of the prettiest sights for me about beekeeping is to go out either in the early morning or the late afternoon and watch the bees coming and going 25 feet up in the air with the sun glistening off of their backs. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and I will also tell you that if you were standing in my yard with 100,000 bees behind you and you had your back to them, you would have no idea that those bees were there. They disperse so broadly, there is no concentration. There is not a single one of my neighbors who would know that I have bees in my backyard if I didn't tell them because they disperse so broadly. Wow, that's awesome. It's very cool, it's that's very cool. cool. <laughs> and I, I appreciate that question because it was actually one of my number one concerns when I wanted to be a beekeeper is I thought, oh my gosh, what are the neighbors gonna say? Um, <laughs> it turns out, they don't say anything until I tell them. <laughs> like, or give oh, them I honey. Have no clue. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, here's some money. Exactly. They're like, oh, I like this idea of that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's very fun. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Sorry, Janice. <laughs> no, no worries. No, no. I, I appreciate the back and forth. I, it's not my habit to be so much of a monologue. So, social organization of honeybees. Then, now the audience can only see my screen, correct? They can't see me. Is that correct? We can see you. Yes. You can see me. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. Because I, I have some uh, I have some show and tell items. And I can spotlight you and see if it makes it a little bit bigger for everybody. Oh, okay, wonderful. Oh. So um and and I just I did I brought some show and tell, so I just want folks to be able to see it. So I am not gonna elaborate on this, but I put it into my presentation because it is so incredibly fascinating. I think, ladies and gentlemen. If humans could learn from bees about collaborative decision-making and acting for the greater good of the colony, our, our species would be much better off. <laughs> so um, um, they just have a wonderful, wonderful organizational system. And, um, and I apologize because I'm getting ahead just a little bit. Um, so on this slide, we're talking about casts. We're talking about there are three types of bees in any hive. Now, can you folks see this? Taylor, can you see this? Hold it up a little higher. We'll see like the bottom half. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. So this is a lovely pen and ink that shows you the three types of bees. 90 to 80 to 90% of your hive is this right here. This is the hard working female. This is the queen and you'll see that this queen has a very long abdomen because she has thousands upon thousands of eggs in her abdomen. This is the drone. He's the male. He makes up maybe 5 to 10% of the um, of the colony. And um, gosh, I always wonder how much detail to go into. And I think I'm going to, I think I'm not going to go into do much detail. But what I want you to know and appreciate, because it's so miraculous, is you have one queen laying eggs. That egg, or the, the eggs that the queen lays, can be one of those three types, it can be a worker, it can be a queen, it can be a drone. And it depends on whether or not the queen chooses to lay a fertilized egg. When she places that egg in the cell, she has a choice of whether or not it's fertilized or not. If it is not fertilized, it will become a male bee. It will become a drone. The majority of eggs that that, female, that queen lays is going to be the worker bees because that's what you need for 80 to 90 percent of your colony. So that's a fertilized egg. That same fertilized egg, once the queen lays it, the decision of whether it becomes a worker bee or a queen bee 
is up to the nurse bees that are taking care of that egg. When that egg hatches, that larva will be fed a concoction of pollen and nectar that is we call royal jelly. For the first three days, that egg gets that royal jelly. After that, if the worker bees, the nurse bees want that egg to become a worker, they'll start feeding a different product. If the worker bees sense that the queen, the existing queen is weak, she's not productive enough, she's getting old, or if they feel like they need to create a new ween, a queen to make a new hive, they will continue feeding royal jelly and that egg will then become another queen bee. It's um, astounding. It's just astounding that, that, that the bees have such a level of control over what's going on in their hive. Um, the, in the hive, uh, talking about task divisions, there are various tasks. The first task is cleaning out the cell where the babies are born. Uh, another task is the queen always has attendants around her. They clean away her poop because she never leaves the hive to poop. They feed her, they nourish her, they guard her. And um, that's one of the tasks. Another task is when bees when foraging bees bring nectar into the hive, they transfer that nectar to a worker bee who then deposits it into the hive itself. So that's another task. Another task is being a protector, being a guard bee. The guard bees typically sit at the entrance of the hive or right inside the entrance. And if they sense danger, they fly out of that hive and they defend the hive. And each of those tasks that I'm describing, each worker bee goes through each of those tasks and, and they go through them in a, in a sequence depending on their age. So the first thing they do is um, take care of the cells and do the cleanup jobs. The last task every worker bee does is foraging. So I can pretty much bet that every bee you have ever seen is an old lady bee who is out foraging and she's at the end of her life and she will literally work herself to death foraging for nectar and pollen. So communication. Communication is another thing that is just marvelous about bees. They have two primary uh, means of communication. One is through pheromones, uh, the odors that they put out. They can put out an alert pheromone that says, hey, our hive is under in danger. We've got to protect our hive. Uh, we need to sting anything that's around. Um, uh, another pheromone can be um, the queen is constantly putting out pheromones and those pheromones, the quantity and the quality of those pheromones tell the worker bees, tell the rest of the hive how well she is doing and how healthy she is doing. And that's how they know that they need to make a new queen and replace her is if her pheromones diminish. Um, another uh, way of communicating that the bees have is one that I know you've heard of. It's called the waggle dance. And once again, I have a video clip, but I am not, I just don't care to spend time with tech messing around with it. When you get this presentation, you're welcome to look it up. We'll, but we'll share it with everybody. Make sure that okay. they can have it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And the waggle dance is a very specific um, set of behaviors that a bee goes through when she has found an excellent source of pollen or nectar, and she is communicating that source to the other bees. Please keep in mind, this is happening in a dark space. <laughs> a beehive is a dark space. There's very little light in there because it's all closed up. So the other bees sense that waggle dance by being close by and sensing where it is. Um, and and she, she tells the location of the food source according to its direction from the sun. And this topic alone, you and I could spend the next six months talking about because it's really complicated and it's really cool. And it's one of the many, many, many wonderful things about honeybees. Okay, moving on. Um, we, we did have one question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, that popped up is the, what is the role of the drones? I assume it's just to mate, but I don't know if that's true or not. 
That is a wonderful question and it's a very appropriate response. Those drones sit around and drink beer and watch TV and hope for a queen to mate with. Um, they don't contribute anything to the hive in terms of acquiring resources. Um, when a drone is mature, they fly up into the sky and there are actually um, specific places up in the sky. This all sounds like fairyland where drones congregate. We call them a drone congregation area. There are very specific places here in Alachua County. Um, very knowledgeable beekeepers can tell you in each location where the drone uh, uh, congregation areas are. And that drone flies up there with the intent of mating with a queen. Um, there are far more drones then there are queens who need to mate. And each queen, by the way, will mate with some 12 to 15 different um, drones. Be, to, and and that, that one flight that the queen takes at, at the beginning of her life, that one flight that she takes to mate with drones, she collects enough sperm from those 12 to 15 drones to last her her entire life. Wow. And get this. <laughs> That queen, during the peak season, that queen is going to lay one to 2,000 eggs per day. Holy cow. <laughs> I tell you, bees are all about the numbers, folks. Honeybees wow. are all about the numbers. And, um, and, and so it's, it's really quite remarkable. So other than that, the drones have no real role. To the point, for whoever asked that question, to the point that in the fall, when the bees are starting to be very conscious about how, many, how much resources, how much food they have to get through the winter, the workers kick the drones out of the hive and they starve to death. Oh. Yeah, so uh, you're welcome, Taylor and Colin, that you get to stay for the winter. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Someone mentioned that they've seen, uh, I don't know if it's the, the drones hanging out or if it's something, but they said that the two bees would be about 30 feet in the air, they would clutch and then free fall, and then they'd fly back up and do that again. Is that some type of... Mm, that's pretty fascinating. And um, I know Tatiana might, might be on this call and she might have a better idea. Typically honeybees, 30 feet is not far enough for them to be mating. Mm -hmm. And that is not the mating behavior that I'm familiar with with honeybees. Typically the, um, the mating area for um, honeybees is like a hundred feet in the air, I believe. And the other thing is, <laughs> boy, th these questions are really Sorry. funny. <laughs> Sorry. So it here's our interest. <laughs> so, yeah, so here you go. Are you ready for this one? Um, after the drone mates with the queen, he dies. He, he actually leaves his projectile in the queen. And he, I, I understand there's actually like a popping, exploding sign and he dies. So this 30 feet in the air repetitive behavior does not sound like a honeybee. Okay. So it could be like, oh, the, me the messenger said it, it was carpenter bees. So. All right. Yeah. Yeah, there so what happens is the phallus is inside this drone and in order for, to copulate with the queen and lock into her, he uses all his hemolymph, which is like the blood of insects to push out his male loving parts into the queen. And after they are locked, he's completely paralyzed because it takes so much effort to move all the blood, to push out, protrude this organ outside of his abdomen. And then the queen flies with him for a little bit. And when she's done, she releases him and he's paralyzed. So he just drops to the ground and dies. Beautiful. Oh. I'm done. There we are. Thank you, Tati. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, these, these questions are making this presentation so much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like this. It's good. I love, it. I love it. I love but... it. Um, so so um, uh, this slide on superorganism is, is what I kind of um, dovetailed into on the previous slide because I just get so excited about this. 
Um, so bees have a very collective decision making. Um, when we hear the word queen, we tend to think that she's the boss. We tend to think that she makes decisions. And that simply is not the case with honeybees. It's, it, it's called a super organism because even though it's composed of individuals, and I actually heard Tatiana give a presentation on this at a bee college, gosh, I'm going to say five years ago, it was a while back. I think it was Tatiana who gave that presentation, but at any rate, it's collective decision making and there is no central governance. There is no central uh, single individual who makes those decisions. So just as an example, um, if I, I'm a beekeeper and, and um, sometimes beekeepers um, uh, purchase new queens from bee, from queen breeders, and we we put those into our hives uh, to replenish our hives. And once again, there's a whole lot of reasons for that, but we're going to keep it there. Um, the bees collectively decide whether or not to accept that queen. They sense her pheromones. Um, they, uh, they have to know that they don't have a productive queen in their colony, but a collective decision is made by those bees whether or not to accept that new queen. A collective decision is made when to kill the queen. Now it might seem counterintuitive to kill a queen, but they kill a queen if she is sick if she is not productive, if they feel that they need to replace that queen, they kill her. Bees collectively um, decide when to swarm and swarming behavior, that's what you're looking at in this wonderful picture. I just uh, get so excited. Uh, this is such a wonderful picture. This is a collection of anywhere between 20 and 40,000 bees that have left a hive looking for a new home. And uh, the bees have collectively decided that they have outgrown their current home. They have collectively decided that they need to procreate another hive, and so they have left. If you see one of these on a tree, hanging from a branch, hanging from anything, these bees are buzzing, and so they can give the impression of being a high alert, dangerous thing, situation. It is not. Somewhere buried in the middle of that is the queen because they take the queen with them and they are literally <laughs> hanging out waiting for scouts to find a new home. They are not typically dangerous. They are not typically aggressive or anything else. They are simply there patiently waiting. And here's one of my show and tells. Um, can you see this? Is this a good angle? Um, this book is in my references on the last page. This entire book that is almost 300 pages was written by Thomas Seeley and it is all his research on how bees decide to swarm and how they decide on which new hive to habitate. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, but I, I, I wanna leave it there with you, but I want you to just understand how fascinating their, their social hierarchy is and how fascinating their decision-making is. Great, okay, so that was kind of, that was to catch your attention. And I'm sure all that stuff about the drone caught your attention. Now we're gonna start talking about the ABCs of, of, of beekeeping. And please know this is a topic that could easily take a couple of hours. So we're just gonna fly through some of the very basic highlights and, um, and just give you a taste of what it takes. We call our place where we have bees, our bee yard. A bee yard should be mostly sunny. It's okay for it to have a little bit of shade, but it should be mostly sunny. Your entrance, and again, let's point out the entrance here is right here, um, should be facing um, uh, the south, um, keeping in mind that here, and, and this, once again, please understand that beekeeping is very local. If you are not sitting here in Gainesville or in Alachua County or in Florida, you need to talk to people who are local. Here in Florida, our stones come from the west and from the north. We do not want the entrance to our beehive uh, facing towards inclement weather. Now, having said that, I'm gonna tell you <laughs> that my beehives are in fact uh, facing north. But in my neighborhood, I have so many trees, I have such a protected area, it really doesn't matter. 
Um, you'll notice that there's a fence, there are shrubs so that my bees are not gonna hop over the fence to my neighbors. The neighbors that are on my other side are kind of far away. And by the time my bees hit the fence on that side of my yard, which is maybe 50 feet, my bees are already 25 feet up in the air. So nobody is, uh, no, nobody is in danger of ha being a part of the, um, the flight path for those bees. Um, behind your bee hives, you should have a good six feet and that's where you're gonna work your bees. When you are in front of the beehive, there are gonna be all these bees coming and going. When you are behind the beehive, there probably won't be any bees at all. They only use the front door. Um, so because of that, if you leave space behind that, that's where you can have your equipment, that's where you can do your working of bees without standing in the middle of where they're, they're coming and going. There should be no tethered or caged animals nearby. In a later slide, you'll see that I have chickens. When I go out to work my bees, if my chickens are not already free ranging my backyard, I let them out. There should be nothing tethered within a couple of hundred feet. And that's actually one of the uh, state of Florida guidelines uh, for beekeeping uh, is how far those tethered animals have to be or caged. Um, you will see that these hives are elevated. Um, uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is it helps keep them away from ants. I mean, you've got a box full of honey, so clearly uh, ants can be a problem. It also is good just in terms of being the beekeeper. You don't have to bend over as far, so far to, to get your bees. And it in general just keeps your beehives cleaner. Uh, so you wanna have them elevated. And you'll see that in this, in this slide, I have some cement blocks and then I have some four by fours that are across that. And, and my hives are actually sitting on my four by fours. There are a couple of ways of elevating your hives. There's no one single way to do it. Okay, how to build a honeybee hive. So what you need is you need a bottom board. I'm gonna try to do this without changing my fly. That's this one. And in Florida, you will see that this area is a screen here in Florida where we have such warm weather, that screen allows ventilation for the hive. Uh, in other climates where it's cold, a lot of times that, that will be a solid piece of board so that you don't get so much ventilation because the ventilation is cold. Uh, here is what we call a brood box. When you hear the word brood, think baby bees. Um, brood is um, the queen lays an egg, the egg becomes a larva, the larva becomes capped in a cell, very similar to the metamorphosis process or the, the, the life cycle process of a butterfly. And that's what we call brood. So when you think brood box, this is where all your babies are going to be. So the brood box is, is fairly deep. It's about 12 inches deep. And that's what this one is. Then you're going to see a frame. This is a frame and I have a show and tell frame. This is a narrower frame. You can see it's not 12 inches, it's about six inches. And you will see this yellow plastic stuff on here. You'll hear that it's very hard. And this is called Plasticell. And if you look very closely, you will see that that plastic is in the shape of honey cells. This is, um, and I also want to let you know, every single thing that I'm saying about beekeeping, there are exceptions. And there are lots of different styles of beekeeping. There are lots of different styles of hive boxes. This particular one is called the Langstroth uh, method for uh, hive equipment. It was created over a hundred years ago by a gentleman in Germany called Langstroth. And it's, 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 it's actually just brilliant um, because the measurements are very specific for bees. So um, the reason this is plastic and it is actually sprayed with a very thin coat of wax, it's just a starter kit for the bees. It just means that the bees don't have to work quite as hard to, um, to uh, get started on building their wax. The wax is the first thing they build before they could do anything else. Um, so that frame, that single frame, is in this picture, you see 10 of those frames all the way across. 
And that is what you see. That's the inside of what you see when you are driving down the road and you see a beehive. Inside that beehive are these frames. Typically in those, it's 10 across. Once again, there are exceptions. Um, I am transitioning to only eight across um, because it's not as heavy for me, um, but that's it. And then the other thing is you're gonna need a lid. Here's a lid. There's nothing very sophisticated about this. And Taylor, going back to your question about jars on top, here you will see that this lid has a hole in it that I have blocked. And that hole, peekaboo, is what you put your honey jar in. Here's a honey jar. You put that honey jar in there and that's exactly what you see when you're driving down the road. So those are the essentials of what makes up. Um, the last item on this slide is a super box. A super box is narrower, um, just like I showed you on here. That's about six inches. So when you think brood box, the deep box, and you think nursery, when you think super box, think honey, because typically the super box is where the bees will store um, nectar and pollen. And eventually that nectar is what they will make into honey. Ta-da, we have a beehive. And talking about uh, beehives, we're gonna do a little bit of nomenclature here. A beehive is the equipment that you are looking at in this slide. A colony is the bees that you put in the beehive. Um, and I wanna point something out to you. Here is the entrance to the hive. And because of the way the boxes are constructed, the entrance act, whoopsie, the entrance actually goes all the way across the bottom. But if you look very carefully, you will see a stick like this. And it's a very fancy name. We call it an entrance reducer. Um, and uh, it, typically what we do is um, we put this across part of the entrance and we only leave a small amount of the entrance open. Why is that? Because if there are predators like wasps that come around or bees from other hives that want to come and take the honey from our hive, if our bees have a small front door, guess what? It's easier to defend. All righty, tools of the trade. Here we go. First thing you're going to need is protective gear. Hat yes, Real sir. quick, go back to that last image. Um, could you, when looking at that, which one's like the brood box and which one's like the super boxes? Is the brood box the one at the bottom? Wonderful question, Taylor. Thank you so much for asking that. Yes. So the brood box is this one at the bottom. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that it's deeper than this one and deeper than this one. And Taylor, you've also uh, invited me kind of to mention something real kind of important. Beekeepers, we always have to think of leaving enough food for our bees. If you harvest too much honey from your bees, you will starve them to death. So we tend to think of this is the bees box. It's primarily brood, some food, but primarily brood. This is the bee box, primarily food, some brood, but primarily food. This one is for me. This uh -huh. is the beekeeper's box. So anything above those two boxes, and again, this is here in Florida where we have mild winters. For me, anything above those two boxes is mine. I have had beehives that were as tall as five boxes. Uh, I think one year I had one that was six boxes tall. So I had four boxes of honey still leaving the bees enough food. Does that help? Uh, yes. <laughs> what kind of, I know some people build their boxes. Do you know yes. what kind of wood is used to build boxes? So those, those ones that you were just looking at are pine. Um, and I have had um, some uh, bee boxes out of cedar. 
And uh, you're absolutely right. If um, and and we'll talk about things that you have to purchase. But if I, I don't, that part of the beekeeping experience does not appeal to me. So I buy everything fully made, and I do paint it. That yellow paint is my my painting. Um, but you can one build your own, buy your lumber and build your own. Two, you can actually purchase kits where you can go to a bee supply store and you can purchase the the parts and then um, put it together yourself. Um, so that's a choice um, that some people some people enjoy that part of it. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Great. My pleasure. Okay, so tools of the trade. So this is, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a shopping list, this is kind of where you want to start. Um, your protective gear, and I would like to share with you at this point. Um, I fully dressed up for beekeeping for a very long time. Two years ago, I went. You know what? It is too darn hot here in Florida, and if I get a sting now and then, that is just all right with me. My current beekeeping attire is a um, um, it's a t-shirt with narrow straps <laughs> and a pair of yoga shorts and uh, socks and shoes and my hat. And I actually use gardening gloves for my hands now. I have I don't use the big leather ones anymore. And um, you will uh, bees typically when you go into the hive, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, their first intent is not to sting you. Uh, sometimes they get grumpy, especially towards August. But as a rule of thumb, I, as I say, I dress like that and I still maybe get stung maybe once a month, maybe once every other month. It just isn't an issue. And I just find that it is too hot here in Florida to wear the full garb. People who have been beekeeping for decades They'll go from the house into the bee yard and not change their clothes. They'll have on some old t-shirt and a pair of shorts and, and that's it. Um, so there's really a lot of room for your comfort level. Um, you are going to need a, whoopsie, pardon me. You are going to need a smoker. I have my smoker here to show you. Um, and you will see, is this a good angle, Taylor? Yeah. Okay. So you have to have fuel for your um, smoker. I have chickens, so I always have hay at my house. So I use hay. Some people use pine straw. I also have acquired some uh, wood shavings from a carpenter. So I'll put my straw in and I'll, then I'll put some wood shavings as well. Um, and um, once I do that, I close the lid. And I will tell you that it is a skill set in itself to learn how to get a smoker going. And then I puff like this. So here's a very tricky question for those of you who have been listening. The two ways that bees communicate is by pheromones and dancing behavior. How is a smoker helpful for bees staying calm and not wanting to smell you and not wanting to uh, attack you? I just gave the hint away. Do 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 We'll wait for we'll see what some people put in the chat boxes. I hear some one person says it disguises. Um it messes up the pheromones. That's what I was gonna guess. It kind of disrupts the smell of the pheromones. Disrupts pheromones. Precisely. If those bees are smelling smoke. Um, they, and that means they are not smelling the pheromones. So that is exactly what it is. It disguises the pheromones. Um, and it is, um, it is, it's just amazing how effective it is. And what other else is amazing is how long, I mean, for hundreds of years, people have recognized that if you use smoke when you're doing um, beekeeping, uh, you get sung less. The other thing I will mention is there's one other theory about it. And that is that when the bees smell smoke, they think in terms of forest fire. And they think in terms of their hive might be in jeopardy. What they do is they go and engorge themselves with nectar and or honey so that if their hive is in danger, they can fly away and have some food sources. Well, any of us who have eaten a large meal 
know that when your stomach is full, you become more lethargic. So one theory of the smell of smoke is that the bees engorge themselves and they become less active. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but that is another theory about it. So, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> so I'd also like to show you this handy dandy little hive tool. As you can see, it's a very simple thing. When I am in my hives, if my fingers represent two frames, I take my hive tool, I stick it in there and boop, I can prop up my frame so that I can take that frame out and inspect it. <coughs> this is, a, it's extremely simple and it's extremely useful. It's not something you wanna go into your um, hive without. Um, I showed you an entrance reducer. I showed you the feeder. Um, so let's go down to buying bees. Where do you buy bees? Well, you buy bees at a bee store, of course. Um, in uh, Beekeeping has become so much of a popular hobby. I think in a whole lot of cities, there are some kind of bee supply stores. Here in Gainesville, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have Daydant um, Bee Supplies, which is a commercial bee supplier that also sells to us little backyard folks. Um, right in High Springs, it's 20 minutes from my house. There are only like seven of them in the entire country and we have one right up the road. You can buy bees um, in several different ways. And you know what, it's getting a little late, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but if you decide to become a beekeeper, there are several ways uh, to buy bees. And, um, and that's how you get started. If you belong to a bee club, sometimes people in the bee club will have extra bees to sell. Um, here, the last item on this is Florida does require registration for all hives. And I tell you what, folks, this is an example of where this really benefits us all. There is a disease called foul brood that is so devastating and so contagious that if it is found, the hive wear and all the bees are burned on site. And so Florida requires registration because they, because once again, we're an agricultural state, um, Florida keeps track of all its bees and all its registered uh, 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 beehive or, or beekeepers. Um, so that if there's, if there's, there are lots of reasons for doing it. But one of the reasons is that if there's foul brood that is detected, uh, they can easily uh, quelch it and they can uh, take action on it promptly. It's something that benefits us as beekeepers. Um, I've had um, state inspectors come look at my hives and they have taught me so much while they have had their noses in my hive. So uh, it's really a wonderful thing. Um, um, and it's, it's important to do that if you're going to be a beekeeper here in Florida. Hive inspections. Why would you stick your head in the thousands and thousands and thousands of bees? Well, because it's such a thrill. I can tell you that pulling out a frame that looks like this just still just almost gives me goosebumps. I get so excited because there's so many wonderful bees on there and I, they're energized, they're active. Um, but here are, the, here are the technical reasons. <laughs> I gave you the emotional reason for inspecting a hive, but here are the technical reasons. How is Her Highness? The first and foremost thing you wanna know is how is the queen bee? Now, please appreciate that when you're looking at bees, once again, you may be looking at 100,000 bees. You may be looking at 50,000 bees. Finding a single bee in all of that is extremely hard. But guess what? You don't actually have to see the queen to know how she is doing. You look at the brood, you look at the babies that have been laid, you look at the brood pattern, you look at the other bees, you look at their energy level, um, and you can tell how the queen is doing and without seeing her for months and months and months. Now, if we are lucky enough to see her, we get very excited because who's not excited to see the queen? Um, but if we don't see her, we can still have a very productive uh, hive inspection. The other thing you're looking for is, is there enough food for these gals? If there isn't enough food, then guess what? You need to give them some sugar water. You are always, always, always looking for pests. Um, the number one pest I think almost universally in the United States is the Varroa mite. There are ways of testing for Varroa mite um, because it's very hard to see. It's, it's, it's actually a, um, 
um, a parasite. So if there is a parasite on a bee, you can appreciate how tiny it is. Um, so it's very hard to see um, with the naked eye while you're doing a hive inspection, but there are ways of testing for them. Um, a pest that is uh, number two on my list anyway is the hive beetle. It is big enough to see with the naked eyes without any trouble at all. Um, you want to see, um, chances are you're going to have some hive beetles. It's all about balancing and not getting too many. You have to look at those frames to see is there still enough room in those frames for the queen to lay more eggs and brood. Keep in mind that during the peak season, your worker bees are only going to live for about 30 days. So if that queen is not constantly laying those one to 2,000 eggs per day, you are quickly going to have attrition of your hive and not have enough uh, bees. So you want to make sure that the queen has enough empty frames or partially empty frames where she can still lay eggs. And then there's curiosity. Honest to Pete, it's just amazing how many things you can learn from watching the bees each time you go in. I always say it's like Christmas and opening a package because you just never know what's gonna be in there when you open up that hive. It's just so much fun. But having said that, mind your own business. Imagine if some giant came to your home and lifted off the roof and started rearranging furniture. That's a little bit like what is happening when you go into your beehive. We three people, I'm in the middle, and this is uh, Mark and my neighbor, uh, Marjorie, we just took off the lid of this uh, bee's home, and we are now pulling out the furniture, so to speak, because we are pulling out the frames. Fortunately, bees have a very amazing sense of concentration, and, and they're actually they're continuing their work even as we are in the hive. But uh, as a rule of thumb, you don't want to go into a hive unless you have a specific reason for doing so. During the peak season, um, during the spring and early summer, we tend to go in every one to two weeks. The rest of the year, gosh, sometimes I'll go for a month without opening that hive. But you don't want to go in unless you've got a reason, some, some reason that you need to check on your girls. So is beekeeping for you? Well, um, as I said at the start, I'm not going to try to talk you into it. It's totally up to you. There are some startup costs. To my recollection, I spent some six to $700 um, when I started up by the time I purchased all my equipment. Um, the, the good thing about that is, is that equipment lasts for a long time. I'm still using some of the equipment that I bought in 2012. Some of it went into a state of disrepair, but some of it is, is still good. But there is um, a, a fairly significant startup cost. Beekeeping in Florida is hot. <laughs> um, you think it's hot in August when it's 95 degrees and you're sitting on the front porch. Imagine putting on protective gear and going out in the sun and opening up a hive. Um, I'm fortunate in that in the around about two o'clock in the afternoon, I start getting some shade on my hives and especially on the backside of my hives. So I try to time my beekeeping uh, with, um, with not being in the sun quite so much. Um, time and timing. Uh, do you have time for beekeeping? Um, I've, I've, full disclosure, I do not actually have bees right now. Um, my bees died last year. I've identified some of the problems and I've had just a whole sequence of things going on in my life and in my home that I've needed to do. So I actually have not gotten bees yet this year. I'm hoping to get them in the next couple of weeks, but I may not. So um, time is real important. It's, um, it's you know, I always say that beekeeping is not like a puppy where you have to take them outside several times a day. It's really high maintenance. And if you go away for the weekend, you have to either take your puppy with you or you have to have somebody puppy sit for you. Bees are not like that. That's one reason I'm a beekeeper. I have gone out of town for a couple of weeks at a time and just checked my bees before I left, set them up for optimal, um, uh, optimal conditions while I'm gone, and then I leave town for two weeks. That's the end of it. Um, timing, and what I mean by timing is kind of that sort of thing. Um, when I had was raising three children and working full time, yeah, no, that wasn't going to cut it. That was not right, the right timing in my life. 
And does BK learning about bees thrill you? I mean, does this stuff excite you? Do you find this just really fascinating to learn about? Um, I would suggest that if you go into beekeeping, go with equal measures of simple curiosity that this is a really fascinating thing to learn about and expectations. If you go into beekeeping, some of your hives will die. I can pretty much promise you that. And you may not get the honey that you were hoping to get. You may not get the wax you were hoping to get. So if you go into beekeeping exclusively with expectations of what you're going, of the products you're going to get from it, even <laughs> a live hive, you're gonna be, your chances are very good you're gonna be disappointed. But if you go into it with an equal sense of curiosity of, oh gosh, my two hives died last year. Let me go back and review my notes. Let me go back and review what I did. Let me go back and review my equipment and try to figure out what happened to those bees so that I can be uh, a better beekeeper the next time around. Annis, um, yes, this, this relates. So you're talking about time and timing and is there, say you wanted to get into beekeeping is there a in uh, ideal time of the year that would solicit more success? I guess um, when when would that be? That annual timing. Wonderful question. And once again, this is very local, so I can only speak to Florida because this is the only place, and and specifically to Alachua County because this is the only place I have ever been a beekeeper. It's a wonderful question, Taylor. First of all, I would say if you want to start beekeeping next spring, start reading now. <laughs> start looking at hive, hive inspections and, and we'll go into that here in a minute as well. But for actually acquiring your bees um, here in Alachua County, um, typically bees, bees start becoming available for sale in March and April. Um, during the winter months, which in Florida, you almost have to use quotation marks for winter. Um, during the winter months, the bee population subsides. The queen dramatically reduces how many eggs she's laying. Sometimes she won't lay eggs at all. So in order to purchase bees, the people who are breeding bees have to come through that winter in January, they start doing things to encourage the queen to start laying eggs, to encourage the bees to start producing wax and all of their products. So typically March, April is when they will actually have bees for sale. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, so gosh, there was actually one lady named Peggy who was biting at the pit for this presentation. And she says, what about honey harvesting? What do you basically have to have? And the next couple of slides are gonna cover that. This slide I chose because it is just a wonderful slide for you. You will see that on this frame of material, there are two distinctly different um, areas. The area at the top is capped honey. Bees are very tidy creatures. And when they are processing nectar, and, and, and I guess actually I should start with the nectar. This is nectar. And if you look very closely, I think in sc your screen, you can see that it's a little bit shiny. Um, and that's because it's nectar um, out of the flower. And, and it's probably in, the bees are probably beginning to process it to make it honey. And two things have to happen for them to process it. One, they, it goes through a series of glands um, in the bees that become honey. And the other thing is, is the bees have to, they actually use their wings to fan this stuff to get the water content below 17%. When those things have been accomplished, those tidy little bees actually put a lid on the cell. And keep in mind, I, I apologize if I use nomenclature, this little individual doohickey, this little hexagon is called a cell. And so the bees actually, once the, the nectar has been fully processed into honey, they cap it. If you harvest nectar, it's going to ferment. It is going to spoil. If you harvest this honey, 
it will not spoil. This frame, I would stick back in the hive and I would not harvest this frame. It has too much nectar and not enough honey. But at any rate, the intent of this slide is to show you what you are pulling out of the hive that you will use for harvesting. Um, and I will also tell you that um, uh, it's important ahead of time to figure out where you're going to do your honey harvesting. I am extremely fortunate to have an absolutely ideal situation for honey harvesting. My bees are in the backyard in the back. When I go to harvest honey, I pull my frames, I put, put them in a bucket, I walk clear around my house to my front porch and I have a large screened in front porch with tile floor that is absolutely ideal for setting up my harvesting equipment. You have to go far enough that the bees won't follow the odor of the honey because they will smell it and they will go trying to get their honey. Um, and I don't mean that in an aggressive manner. It's just the bees are always foraging, always looking for food. So typically after I finish harvesting, harvesting, there's a one to two dozen bees who have found their way to my front porch and they're on my screen, but they can't get in because it's screened. No, so I know we're running mm -hmm. out of time, but it just there's so many questions. Um, the can bees differentiate honey types? So if can they tell that it's their honey from their hive, or um, um, or is it just honey's honey? Doesn't matter. That's an interesting question. I don't know the first answer. I don't know if they can distinguish honey from their hive versus other. I would suspect they can because they're so, such perceptive perceptive creatures. Uh, the other thing is it doesn't matter. It's all food to them. It's all food to them. So <laughs> they're, they're going to follow the scent of honey because it's the scent of honey, not because it's necessarily theirs. Okay, thank you. So the first thing you have to do when you go to harvest honey, oh, I am so sorry. Every time I try to use my cursor, um, it goes on. In this picture on the left-hand side, you will see an individual holding a hot knife. It's an electric hot knife and he is slicing off the lid to the honey because you cannot get the honey out of the frame until you have removed the lid. Now there are a couple ways. Um, that hot knife, I was not crazy about it. If the knife gets too hot, it can scorch the honey. If it's not hot enough, it won't slide through the wax. Keep in mind it's hot because it's designed to slice through the wax. Um, I just was not a fan of that. I, I am a fan of simplicity. This is a, um, oh gosh, what do we even call this? Um, we call it a comb. And basically all we do is we take that and we scrape those caps off of the, um, off of the we scrape off the lid of the wax um, so that we can get to our honey. And I want you to notice, ah, darn it. Okay, down here, you can see that pile. That pile is the thin sheet of wax that has been cut off from the frame. That wax is what I use to make candles. I have an old crock pot. I stick that wax in my old crock pot, melt it down and make candles. So even though I don't, I don't do a lot of wax harvesting from my hives because I'm more interested in the honey, this is a way that I am able to capture the wax and use the wax for something else without taking away from my, uh, my colony, my, my hives. Okay, I, I know it's getting late, so I'm kind of speeding up here. Honey harvesting is extremely simple. I'm not gonna use my cursor, but in that top right, you will see a canister that is a uh, honey extractor. It's a frame extractor. It's about two and a half feet tall. If you have ever used an old fashioned ice cream churn, this thing is very similar. Basically, you cut off the cap, you stick the frame in there, you crank the handle, and that uh, device whirls uh, that frame around in the container. And that whirling causes centrifugal force to throw that honey out against the sides of the device. And then it simply, um, um, it, it simply um, drips down into the bottom. And guess what? In this picture on the left, go very gently, Janice, there is a spout on the bottom of that canister. 
And all I do is open that spout and you'll see the white bucket down below. That white bucket actually has a fairly fine filter on it. And that honey goes through the filter and in the bottom and guess what? Then I take it to my kitchen sink. I have a bunch of clean jars that I have recycled from other purposes and I fill the jars up. And there on my counter, you're seeing about 30 pounds of honey that I got from that harvest. In a typical year, I will harvest honey two to four times and get, as I said, uh, anywhere from 100 to 120. I think one year I got 150 pounds of honey. I think that year I had three hives, but primarily two hives will give me that much honey. It is a glorious thing. I just love it. That's a so lot. So fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating facts. This is something you can read at your own. I just wanted to make sure that I ended the talk uh, with uh, something fascinating. Uh, I will say that uh, down uh, the very last um, uh, bullet on that, you'll see the documentary Honeyland is about the struggles of a beekeeper in Macedonia. This is not a light documentary, it's, it's, um, but it's fascinating because it gives you a sense of how long people have been beekeeping and they don't have all the equipment you and I just talked about and they don't have protective suits that you and I just talked about they just go out there and collect honey from bees um so that's that uh how to get started early um read uh and and uh on my resources you're going to see IFAS is just full of resources, absolutely full of resources. And there are some links to get to that. If you only had that one resource, you'd be in great shape to get educated to be a beekeeper. Join a local bee club. Beekeeping is local. The locals there will be able to tell you what to do. Uh, and here, uh, use the uh, IFAS website, read, see the recommended reading. I've suggested several books for you. Observe a high inspection. Uh, wherever your local bee club is, believe me, they are so used to getting requests to observe a hive inspection. Just contact them and ask if they have any beekeepers who would be willing to let you join them. Um, if beekeeping isn't for you, please support local beekeepers, buy local honey. When you go to the farmer's market and you see a jar of honey and it has a $15 or an $18 price tag on it, don't complain. You have no idea the work that these beekeepers have put into um, creating that jar of honey that they can sell to you at the far farmer's market. It's very important to su uh, support them because they're doing this for a living. And um, that's what you can do without doing any beekeeping. Please avoid pesticides and herbicides in your gardens and thank a bee. You'd be very hungry without them. Thank you so much for your attention. I, I, it's been very fun. I also have beekeeping and ecosystems. I have chickens. My chickens go over to my bee yard. You'll see them over here. They eat some of the pests that would harm my bee, bees. Uh, my chicken poop goes into my compost bin. I have a rain barrel. I never use city water for watering my plants. I use a rain, rain barrel. I got my solar panels on my roof. And um, beekeeping can be a part of being a conscientious consumer and being a, aware of our environment and how we can um, be more friendly to our environment and our mother earth. Thank you so much. May I answer any questions? <laughs> that was stellar. That was so good. Um, <laughs> I think I think we're gonna overwhelm FDAX. You know, this next spring, we're gonna probably have a bunch of requests to uh, for new beehives. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good thing. So I do have a few questions. Um, my son just joined <laughs> us. <laughs> Shh, buddy. Um, could you talk a little bit about the colors of hives? Because I know that you your mm -hmm. hives, they were yellow. Is there a mm -hmm. reason you color them yellow? Or is that just for fun? Or is there something that's associated with colors and attracting bees? Wonderful. Flowers uh, in their home. Yeah, so, so the bees don't really care. Uh, that's me in aesthetics. I find yellow to be a very cheerful color and it stands out. You do want to avoid dark colors. You want to avoid dark colors in your clothing. You notice that uh, the, the ghee garb is always white and you want to avoid dark colors for your hives. It, it absorbs more sun. And I have heard the theory that 
Bees associate dark colors with predators like bears, raccoons, whatever. And for that reason, um, bees are just very sensitive to dark colors. Uh, having said that, I have seen many people do their beekeeping in a pair of jeans. Oh, pardon me. Um, uh, but we, we do tend to stay uh, away from dark colors. Other than that, um, it, it's really up to your choice um, and what appeals to you. Wow. Thank you very much. And I do want to put a plug in because you're talking about, um, you know, if you're not going to do bees, how to support local bees populations. So on, um, there's a really cool publication I'll share with everybody. It is like natural pesticides or how to control pests with natural products in your yards and landscapes because following integrated pest management strategies so to minimize pesticide use and herbicide use. But also uh, we have our uh, plant sale coming up and the plant sale on May 15th at Cusca Willa in Micanopy from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And we have plenty of pollinators there that bees love. So I was out there this morning and there's just bees everywhere. Well, pollinators oh. everywhere. Oh. So they were, they were having a field day. <laughs> that's so exciting and and you'll see uh tagging into you yeah and our master gardener sale is always fantastic there's so many wonderful plants and it's we grow these plants so we we they're the quality plants you'll see um that on on my reading list is bringing nature home by doug Tallamy. and quite honestly that's only um peripherally uh associated with my bee talk but it is such a wonderful book about the importance of native plants that uh, i stuck it in there Wonderful. Is that the one that Wendy Wilbur recently did as the state uh, book, yes. book club? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's a good book. That's a very good book. It's a fantastic book. I just, it really was an eye opener to me. So there's one other question that I think was kind of answered earlier, but um, what do the bees do like the pollen versus the nectar? Wonderful question. So Paul, fantastic question. Pollen is protein. Nectar is carbohydrates. A mature bee typically just uses nectar. They only need the carbohydrates. But pollen is needed for the babies. So when that egg hatches and it is in the larval stage, the bees mix the pollen with the nectar and create baby food. <laughs> and um, so that's the importance of pollen. Um, so in your hive, um, gosh, I don't know about proportions, but the majority of the food that the bees will collect is going to be nectar because everybody needs nectar. A smaller proportion will be the pollen. And that's, and, and, and when I, as a beekeeper, go into a, uh, a, a beehive and see lots of pollen, I'm very happy because that tells, that's one of the signs that I can see that I got a good active queen and those workers are bringing in pollen because they know that that, be, uh, that queen is gonna be cranking out babies. That's great. And I think Colin has a, a question. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Janice, that was a fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you. So what is the prevalence? And uh, you didn't get into bee diseases, obviously, and problems. But just for me asking, what is the prevalence of the colony collapse disorder here in Florida? Is it, is oh. it prevalent yet here? That is, that is a wonderful, wonderful question. And first of all, I would say I, this is a topic I do not know a lot about. Okay. Um, my understanding is that colony collapse disorder is only a term that is used to describe a phenomena with commercial beekeeping oh, okay. operations. Um, and the, 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 the only guidance I can provide to that question, Colin, is that it appears to be a not a single problem. It appears to be a, a conglomeration of problems that added up caused the colony collapse disorder, which is when the bees simply disappear. They simply don't come home. Um, well, I may and they say just... something about that. Thank you. Uh, colony collapse disorder, yes, you're correct, Janice, is a conglomerate of things that affect honeybees. 
any apiary can um, can be said that had a colony collapse. It can be backyard, sideliner, or commercial. Some of these stressors that contribute to colony collapse are um, typically the number one for, by most beekeepers, regardless of the scale is Barroa. Uh, that goes as, uh, with loss of habitat, um, which it results in loss of nutrition. So poor nutrition to the hives definitely affect them no matter what. Um, pesticides, um, bad, bad weather, that's something that cannot be controlled, but is one of these stressors. And then uh, queens, poor queens or uh, weak queens, how some beekeepers call it, but that is kind of like a very vague term that depends sometimes of the genetics. And again, how is that colony being, man being maintained? Colony collapse is not something that we can necessarily avoid. We can minimize the stressors to honeybees to our best. By, and if you want to help bees, the best thing you can do is to provide some habitat. Diversify your landscapes. That is the best way to help honeybees. The only way that currently exists to really keep um, the hives free or not free, but at low levels of Barroa mite in the United States, unfortunately, is through the use of mitocytes. There are a lot of alternatives. There's a lot of things that we can do culturally to try to help the bees. But currently, unfortunately, we will have to recur to do constant monitoring. And when we reach the threshold, treat for Barroa mites. Sorry, Barroa. And Tatiana, if I'm not. Uh, mistaken, there's been a recent change now uh, by the uh, FDA that um, uh, the miticides now have to be prescribed by a veterinarian. Correct. So what, in response to this, and, and in Europe too, many veterinary schools are now adding uh, beekeeping and diseases and husbandry to their curriculum. And uh, uh, it may take a while, but uh, more and more veterinarians are going to be uh, competent uh, in uh, answering those questions and prescribing the appropriate medication for uh, this disorder, or such as it is, and other issues. Right. So, says the uh, says the uh, master gardener veterinarian. <laughs> Good luck for veterinarians. <laughs> uh, and that place will be the bbfd.com. And that's where people applies for the prescriptions for controlling Barroa mite. So if you mm -hmm. decide to get into beekeeping, you need to become very familiar with Barroa, how to monitor it and how to treat for it. Awesome. Thank you, Tati. Um, there was one question I accidentally cleared out. Um, let me go back to it. Oh, no. I lost it. I apologize. Never mind. I don't know where it went. Maybe I'm just the making things up in my head. Answered, Taylor. Say it again, Colin. I think the questions have all been answered. I don't yeah. see any open ones. Yeah. So, but. Um, I do want to, I did put in the chat box um, the link for our follow-up survey we do for every single program. We're going to upload this onto our YouTube page, but we'll follow up with a list of all these resources and other cool documents that relate to this. And we'll even include the links for the videos that we didn't share that were part of Janice's program today. Um, we, um, we did have, oh, can we rent a hive? Is it possible to rent hives? Like I know technically like ag producers can when you have the trucks come in um, with bees, but can like homeowners or would that be a value at all? I, I do not know, Tatiana might be more informed on that. I do know that when I was in the bee club, uh, sometimes we would get calls from folks asking if somebody would just be willing to move their hives to that lo some location for a while. Um, so I guess I don't know. Yeah, it's mostly 
on like on beekeeping to beekeeper to beekeeper arrangement if you want somebody to look after your apiary. Um, some farmers ask if um, there is a beekeeper that can bring their hives, but um, there, there needs to be a contract on that because you as a beekeeper, your interest is to keep those bees alive and the farmers need to produce a crop. So if there is any fungicides or, or insecticides applied that may kill your bees. So the renting is really like, if it's for commercial purposes, there is a contract in between and there is a specific language for it, but uh, not commercial renting of bees is more of like a person to person arrangement. And it depends, like a lot of people, what they encounter is there is not enough uh, foraging or there is not enough food for their bees to mm -hmm. forage. So that's when the, that type of situation present themselves that they need to move their apiary to their locations because their colonies are weak. They're not getting enough food into the, into the colony. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we've come to the end of the program. And um, again, I put that follow-up survey link and we'll follow up with information. Um, Janice, thank you. That oh, it's been such a joy to be here with you. Thank that you. That was such a fun presentation. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, um, Colin. I know there's one question that will we have bees at the new extension office? And yes, we'd like to have bees. So it's just a matter of how we're going to maintain them and all of that stuff. But um, so we have Janice that can help teach us. <laughs> so, <laughs> something, right. to, something to look forward to. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, again, thank you, Janice and the Master Gardener volunteers that helped out. Thank you, Tatiana. She's our commercial horticulture agent here in Alachua County. Um, and just as a reminder, we have our plant sale on May 15th. Um, at Cuscawilla, which is in Micanopy. It's from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. and it is full of wonderful pollinators to help support your um, plants or the, your bees within your community and other pollinators. Anyways, Janice, thank you very much and thank you everybody for uh, My joining pleasure. Us today. Thank you. Thanks for joining everybody. <laughs>